Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, our talk uh, this morning is Unlocking the Secrets of the Proxmark IDV4 uh, by uh, Christian Herbert and myself, Kevin Barker. Okay, uh, we'll just give you a bit of an overview of uh, what we're going to cover uh, in our talk this morning. Uh, so first of all, we'll just introduce ourselves to you and our backgrounds of what we've been up to. Uh, what exactly is a Proxmark? I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the uh, with the Proxmark or have used the Proxmark in the past. Very good. Excellent show of hands. <laughs> Uh, then uh, we will go through uh, previous generations, why the art of E4 exists, uh, and addressing the various different limitations that existed in uh, previous generations of the Proxmark. Uh, once we've done that, uh, then we'll move on to the various different uh, uh, features and functionality that we've added that uh, enable further uh, RF analysis. Uh, then uh, we'll give you a few usage examples of these, uh, a demonstration of these uh, features that we've uh, unlocked for you, uh, a little bit of the contact interface, LF GUI, and then a bit of a Q&A. All right. Uh, Chris, if you'll go. To, oh, yeah. that's me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, Christian Herman here, and uh, RFID researcher, yes, of course. And Proxmark administrator on the forum. I don't know. Yeah, all of you has done the Proxmark before. Uh, I guess you've been to the forum. Nod. Show hands. Two of you. Three of you. Oh, oh my. So I don't know. That's good. Uh, uh, software developer. Um, usually do the uh, Microsoft.NET platform things, but this is my greatest hobby, so that's what I do. I'm also the maintainer of a kind of popular fork called the Iceman fork. If you're into Proxmark or RFIDs, you most likely have stumbled upon it. Uh, you know, all these times, everybody nods now, yes. That's the reason why you like it, and I know why. Now that's me. Let's go over to Kevin. All right. Uh, I'm nodded by the alias, uh, zero X F F F F. Uh, I used to hide a lot in the shadows, uh, as a NFC RFID researcher. Uh, I generally found myself, uh, getting tapped on the shoulder by companies that I offended because I reversed, uh, some of their hardware. Uh, I generally, uh, spend a lot of time out of hours, uh, reverse engineering various different cards and reader technologies. Uh, I like to take things for swims in acid and, uh, take out the ICs and, uh, dump firmware, etc. Uh, and then based on, uh, the research, I then, uh, reinvent my own versions of those, uh, through smart card development and other hardware, uh, solutions. Uh, on top of that, uh, I've been uh, the Proxmark 3 administrator for over a decade now, uh, the Proxmark 3 forum administrator and GitHub administrator. Uh, you probably don't see any of my activity if you are a follower of the Proxmark because I sort of sit in behind the shadows and communicate with the others behind the scenes. So, uh, yeah, uh, this is, uh, much, much like Chris, uh, this is a full-time hobby. This is something that we just do for kicks and, uh, it's, it's something that, uh, we're, we're quite passionate about. Okay. Uh, moving on to the Proxmark. So, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, the Proxmark, uh, was originally developed all the way back in 2007 by a developer or a researcher at the time, uh, known as Jonathan Westchews. Uh, he produced the original Proxmark 3 and, uh, it, uh, quite, uh, quickly became, uh, popularized as the, uh, uh, the Swiss army knife of, uh, RFID research. Uh, it was uh, perhaps one of the most popular tools used for NFC RFID uh, analysis and it led on to uh, a lot of different uh, uh, plug and play solutions for uh, MyFair uh, cracking, Crypto One, etc. Uh, then on top of that, we have the RFID security research tool for, uh, HF, LF and contact, uh, which is what you see in the image here, uh, a versatile RFID security research, uh, uh, device, uh, which we now, uh, allow access to, uh, physical interface, uh, 7816 contact cards, SIM cards. Uh, 
The reason why we uh, decided that uh, we needed to become a little bit more active is because uh, we found that the original designs uh, were a little bit underwhelming. Uh, RF performance overall was uh, subpar. Uh, read range on these uh, devices were quite small. Uh, there was a lack of various different interface options and those uh, physical interfaces were often uh, difficult to work with. Uh, any of those who are familiar with the original Proxmark 3 uh, probably share my hate of the high rose connector uh, that exists on the PM3 that's uh, in this illustration here. Uh, the other thing is that uh, these these original designs were quite bulky, though they weren't really uh, suitable for use in other applications such as uh, red teaming, any sort of covert type application. Uh, to set this up, you'd require a laptop, leads, separate antennas, and, and by the end of it all, you, you'd have to uh, carry a satchel with you uh, in order to conceal everything that you had if you were uh, going to uh, carry out an attack uh, perhaps on one of your uh, client sites. Which is why we decided this is our place. This is where we should be. So, to address these limitations, we decided to come up with something sexy like this. That particular board that you see there is a fraction of the size of the original uh, Proxmark. Uh, and uh, Chris uh, has in his hand here uh, the two different generations. So, we have uh, in his right hand here uh, the original Proxmark, and in his other hand, uh, that is the newer generation with the antenna attached, so substantially smaller uh, than, uh, than uh, the other models available. Uh, we've uh, addressed some of the issues with uh, interfacing by uh, providing a flexible RF interface, which allows uh, custom RF uh, antenna coupling. Uh, we've uh, made substantial improvements with LF and HF uh, read performance, uh, one of the other issues that we felt uh, needed addressing was the uh, the lack of storage, the inability to uh, store keys, or perhaps the entire of the card data, uh, which uh, you would perhaps like to use for an RF simulation. Uh, in, in previous uh, uh, scenarios, uh, what you would need to do is uh, load everything up using a laptop uh, on, onto the Proxmark and have everything connected at the time that you're doing a simulation. Uh, offline modes came on uh, afterwards after a number of years of commits and uh, now we have a full offline uh, with emulation and storage of up to 64 keys. Yeah, not to mention that um, since it wasn't contact, uh, you'd need to have a cable connected to the laptop all the time, otherwise it would lose the memory, so you couldn't get the traces out of the Proxmark when you did that. Even if you had a battery in it, you can reconnect it to the client, which is like one of his major downsides. Something that was addressed in Weisman Fork two years ago. Uh, which you can reconnect to the device even if it was on battery and stuff. That was kind of nice. Uh, the two megabyte flash memory, yeah, we're going to talk about that later on. But it, it really helped out. It's with this, Absolutely. it becomes more flexible and, uh, you can actually use it in the field. Without it, it's eh, whatever. We're going to show you off more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Adding uh, on to the 7816 interface. Okay. You love that one. Snuck in behind uh, the PCB uh, in this illustration is a uh, is an interface uh, that uh, allows you to uh, to attach a, a SIM card. Uh, yeah. In addition to uh, everything else that we've done, uh, yeah, it's it's covert. It's small. It's something that you can perhaps strap to your wrist, and nobody would know any different if you had a long sleeve uh, t-shirt or a jumper on. Uh, again, uh, that's yeah, allowing red teams uh, more access uh, to the Proxmark. Uh, they don't necessarily need to have the skill set uh, to be able to use this device out in the field. Uh, the uh, uh, technical team often sort of stand out like a sore thumb. Uh, so we thought that uh, uh, being able to provide a separate interface uh, for uh, additional options such as uh, active antennas for even longer range, uh, a UART uh, for optional uh, Bluetooth or other type of wireless communication options, and uh, battery so the unit can operate in a complete standalone mode. Yeah, you don't see it. can go back again. <laughs> yeah. This is a connection for the SIM card. You don't see the module on this one. It's uh, Yeah, it's a small, slim one. But it connects there, places over. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, the flexible RF interface, uh, as you can see in the illustration here, uh, allows for uh, custom uh, RF antennas uh, with uh, their own uh, coupling capacitors, etc. Uh, in previous generations, it was just a two-wire interface, which essentially forced people uh, designing their own antennas for specific applications, perhaps capsules, etc. Uh, they would need to do board-level uh, modifications on the Proxmark uh, to be able to provide those solutions if they were concerned about their tuning and RF performance overall. Uh, the uh, All of this information, by the way, or all of these slides uh, will uh, release after the presentation. So if you would have a, if you're interested in the physical characteristics and uh, interface options, uh, we will release those to you. Uh, the two meg uh, SPI flash uh, that we uh, touched on uh, earlier, uh, as I said, allows offline uh, uh, simulation. Uh, we have our storage options and uh, we have those divided uh, into uh, a typical uh, 4x64 kbyte uh, kbit uh, pages divided into 16 by 4 kbit, uh, kbit uh, sectors. It's a kind of funny story about that one when we develop it. Um, I don't know if you're into flash memories, you know how SPS, SPI flash memory works. But I sure didn't do it when we first added it, and I was supposed to add some software for it and support for it in the client. And it turns out that um, it's uh, you know you write, you reset it, we wipe it to putting it to once, fill it with XFFs everywhere, and then you flip it to zero. But you can only do that once. Then you have to wipe it again from the zeros to get become a one again. And I didn't know that when I did that and start. That was just a mind opener when someone told me that. No, that's not how it works. And we have this idea of uh, adding an uh, SPI flash uh, file system, uh, SPI FFS. But the thing is, the ARM processor is so small, and it's kind of full of other stuff interesting in it. So we don't know how really to fit in. We should be able to fit it in, and we will get, um, you know, the file sections. Since it's 4K sectors, you only get like 16 files per page. So. But it's still very much doable from what you had before because of the, you know, if you remember the trace log, which is like 40k size, you have more space now and it's persistent. So yeah, that will help out, especially for saving simulation and traces and, and dumps from data. Okay. Uh, we have a few demonstrations uh, that we'd like to show you uh, of the product. Uh, they, these are just uh, quite, quite simple demonstrations that uh, you'd be able to execute on uh, most Proxmarks, but some of these uh, address some of the uh, features that we implemented on the Proxmark 4 as well. Oh yeah, let's see what is going on. Hard nested. Okay, right. Uh, can you pause it? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Can't it again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the attacks that came out lately, 2016, a new paper was released by Royal uh, to finalize that the uh, parity functions of it. Oh, Renault is there. He knows this by heart. You know, crypto experts like them. It's all, it was amazing to see those people. Anyway, he came up with a paper, did finally fall and said they find the coffin in the crypto one, um, uh, crypto for saying that there's an in, built in weakness in it. And they, he developed an idea called the hard nested. It was implemented by uh, three different people at the same time. Um, that was PV and uh, blah post. And along uh, in the end comes a guy called Azid. Pee did a very interesting one. That's why uh, 2016 you saw the, he didn't add a solver. He had a function saying that we can find the key. And he made really advanced uh, improvements in collecting nouns. This whole attack gathers nouns, if you know the MyFair classic attack. And it, he did that really well. It takes 10,000, 20,000 nouns and you know, and you, did that quite in, in five minutes. It's not bad for such a complex attack. It's a time memory off trade attack, so you have like 16 or 50 megabytes of bit flipping files for it, uh, working in the background. And when you analyze this, um, you go and, uh, yeah, that's the Iceman fork, of course. We added this PNG detection, so you can see which kind of tar, uh, card you have. If uh, my classic card is of a weak one or the hardened one, uh, which is the new improved one. With the hardened one, you need a known key before to start it off, uh, once you identify it. That's how it works, because you need to get uh, authentication attempts. 
So that's the first step. If you want to do this, you need to either sniff it or you should have to check your default keys for it. Anyway, let's go on. What should we do now? There's something I implemented also is like checking keys fast. That's why we go. There's a normal one called uh, check keys from it. But, uh, you know, what you need is a large default key list, which is found. I have 604 ones in my uh, fork. And the F-check uses different uh, strategies to uh, analyze and go through the whole card's uh, sectors and find the keys, if it is, and try to minimize the amount of time spent in hardness. So first you have to do this. It takes a little bit while. And um, it's 32 sectors, uh, 32 keys times 604. So it's a lot of attempts running on there. Doesn't take too long, though. This card <coughs> might or might not have been a, a hotel in this uh, area. And um, uh, to to <coughs> prove it, it's it's uh, uh, the default keys just finds it all. Uh, you see the result here says one. It means that we found all the keys uh, for sector A and B, uh, or key type A and B. And just to prove it's right, so you don't even have to execute a hard nested attack in order to get and dump a key in a file nowadays uh, or a tag a hard if you you know if you find it. What you do need is one of these keys to execute the hard nested attack, which is you tell huh? Screens on that. Yeah, about it. So, yes. So, uh, trying to run a hard nested attack individually against 32 or well, 31 keys because you have one already uh, takes time and it's a little bit tedious. So, I wrote the script a couple of years ago and then I improved it a little bit more. And that's what we call the improved hard nested out upon attack. This is the known as key vector that you do, sector zero, and it defaults to key type A. And when you run it, it detects if it's this one. If not, it goes over to go the dark side attack and try the nested attack, but that's a different story. And it tries also to do its check keys while it... While you do it. Uh, in order to do that, instead of trying to do hard nested on all sectors, which takes time, about 15 minutes per piece, you uh, just run it against the ones who is not found. And there's a tendency among cards, like you saw in the first video, that you use default keys and you reuse the same key on several sectors. So once you actually find the correct one key, you just try and check keys against all the other sectors to save time, to make it faster. And if you pause about pretty soon, uh, 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 and we can pause now. Uh, if you look at this, this is the new hard nested. Uh, why I see this is the amount of nouns it collects. It only collects 1,878. We can collect about 59 nouns uh, per second, kind of fast. And uh, it goes from the whole key space, which is estimated, and how this fast uh, my computer can run. Uh, and it's just a bit flipping things and it comes down to a cracking time of 16 seconds, uh, which I mentioned about the solve that PV didn't make. Uh, PV made a, he had it privately, but blog post made a solver for this. And it was fast as fuck. And then this Azid guy comes up and it is this bit sliced implementation of it and it was even faster. However, he, did it, and I saw it, he did it, and I asked him, can we like, implement it in the Peroxmark client? And he's like, yeah, okay, let's do that. So we actually got it in there, and then PV, after one and a half years, improved his attack to make only this 1800 announcers, also took the bit sliced uh, implementation of it, so this is what we have now. So a hard nested attack right now is kind of fast. It doesn't take very long time, and it's a very strong cryptocurrency attack for this one. Let's play. Sorry. Yes. Found one key. Checking keys again. 
takes the next sector, we found there are lots of sectors. Tries again. That's a little boring, isn't it? This is what happens when you run attacks and you think, oh god, it should be like immediately, but it doesn't. Uh, this is the downside of running these things. But when you look about how much work this actually goes into run these things so smoothly, you become quite impressed. Down to four minutes, he says, estimate. Runtime is 33 seconds. 2,500 announcers. Found the key again. Found the whole keys. And then the script asks if you want to dump the keys to a uh, file. And it asks if you want to dump the whole data. So it's pretty much automatically done. So you don't have to do a thinking about it or working with it. Kind of easy. So, uh, no, I have to wait for that moment. That's the root. Okay. Um, yeah, we can wait until we talk about the spark. Because that's the spark copy. Okay. Yeah. We save some videos for later. <laughs> Okay. Uh, one of the things that was missing from the Proxmark uh, was the ISO 7816 uh, type interfaces. Uh, we didn't have uh, any facility for uh, card-based or physical card-based uh, analytics. Uh, the various different uh, uh, interface options that we went through, uh, in the end we decided to go for a custom, excuse me, <coughs> uh, uh, decided to go for a custom interface uh, for uh, the contact uh, contact chips. Uh, uh, through uh, uh, through this implementation, we added uh, a whole series of SC commands. Uh, these SC commands uh, allow us to uh, send through uh, raw APDUs and get responses and uh, decode TLVs. Uh, Question: Has anybody run any raw APDUs for a smart card before? Okay. Have you run it against a wireless card? Oh, contactless card? You have. Congratulations. You win a card. <laughs> I think it's fun. This. It's going to be some takeaway for you guys. <laughs> so only one has used Proxmark. So you have a guy who's used Proxmark. What have you, what have you used it for? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you have guys. Oh, girls. Anybody use the Proxmark for red teaming? My fair. My fair. My fair. Legit. Ah, interesting. Uh -huh. Right, you get another one, but yeah. can't use it for Legic, though. So how do you find the Legic implementation? Or did you try it lately, or did you use it for before? I, uh, I cloned the Simicast in the Legic for instance. Yeah. When did you do that? One year ago. Okay. You're going to find that there, there's have been uh, significant improvements about read range with uh, Legic in, uh, by, by doing this. Oh, we weren't supposed to talk about this, but we do anyway now. <laughs> I'm going to get cut into this. Yeah. Uh, when we decided about this uh, Proxmog RV4, uh, we didn't know that the, the, you know, the community is going to be a little bit slow. You don't know how we're going to handle it, you know. So are we going to do they want to have another Proxmark? You know, like, mm, we don't know. It's like, what is going to make about it? You know, stuff. And it, it, what ended up, you know, when we had the Kickstarter, it was successful. We were like very happy about the community. It's like, well, wow, that's impressive. And when people goes, so, you know, we started coming back to, to, to the forum and do things. And about that, uh, around that, we, we had this discussion about antenna and reading range about that. This is our large antenna, which increases the read range about to 14 centimeters. Yeah, is, have you seen all of these old videos by people going like, like that, you know, you know, with this? Have you seen it, you know, with this? Well, everyone has seen that. After pocketing, like, oh, fucking a laptop. Always uncomfortably close. Yeah, yeah. Keep your, <laughs> keep your box box close. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, imagine you take that one away in the middle, but this one is very small. Covered 14 centimeters. Pretty much, you know, you can walk by one now. But you didn't come this by brand new hardware. 
new people came in, old people came back, and they started fixing things. So we're fixing code in FGA code for uh, analyzing the module and the, the signal and fixing the, uh, in the ARM code. So even the logic now works perfectly with a read range about eight centimeters. So it's even easier nowadays. And it's amazing. I'm very thankful for it. Sorry. Okay, uh, so with, with this interface, uh, because we wanted to keep the Proxmark as covert as possible, uh, we decided to go for a standard SIM size uh, uh, card uh, interface. Uh, so what we have inside uh, the Proxmark is a standard SIM interface with an 8051 that hides behind the scenes, uh, that does all the uh, interpretation for us. Uh, then uh, after that, uh, we've got this uh, optional uh, interface for full-size SIMs. Uh, sorry, uh, full-size cards, uh, ID1 style. Uh, so that way, uh, if need be, uh, you can always add the option uh, into the Proxmark 4. Yeah. Not to mention, we got some mastery about that. We can actually uh, emulate contact cards now with it. So uh, we're going to bring this to the next level of research. We've, we've already uh, basically uh, uh, committed enough code to be able to carry out enough analysis on uh, payment type systems. Uh, we could read uh, a type of uh, credit card uh, that somebody might have. Uh, we could read transaction data, uh, and we could also uh, emulate uh, a lot of uh, the various different aspects of a lot of physical interface uh, type cards, uh, not specifically credit cards, but uh, we are uh, working on that at the moment. Thank you the video. I'll go back. You want to see a demo of it? Yeah. Oh, you're awake. I thought I'm the one who got coffee. How do you do that again? All right. Yeah. All right. So you have a brute command. Uh, it's actually tried to brute force the. The short, <laughs> uh, the, the SF file uh, names of the records that's into the payment uh, AID. It goes very fast though, and and it's uh, it's based on Adam Laurie's uh, Chappie. Have you ever uh, used that one? No. Okay. Anyway, uh, it tries to brute force. There's another guy called uh, Peter um, Fillmore. Yeah, he's an Australian who did really much uh, into the CME stuff. He's also made a better version of it and, uh, you know, just the, figure out the short file names index, what, which ones there are. So you can actually dump one of those cards very, very fast. And you see the TVL uh, decoding of it. That comes actually from a guy called Murloc who done it now for contactless and contacts. So you can get out the same data out of both of types of interface on those kinds of cards nowadays. Uh, earlier on, I uh, mentioned uh, SC raw commands uh, being able to send through uh, APDUs. So uh, without going into too much detail, uh, APDUs are essentially like uh, the, the, the basis for all the communications with uh, these types of cards. Uh, it's very quite, uh, really quite simple. Uh, the packet structure and uh, response types. Uh, what we have here is uh, simply uh, the ability to uh, ignore any responses if we just want to issue a command. Uh, we've got the ability to uh, reselect the card uh, if uh, need be. Uh, and we also have the option to decode TLV data. Uh, because nobody had a show of hands, I'm not sure if anybody deals with uh, credit cards or anything like that. I think uh, we might just uh, move on from that one there. It's uh, we pretty much have everything in place for uh, at least getting started with contact-based card systems. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's another one Good. we were saying about. Um, if you use the LF uh, parts of the, of the Proxmo client, you see that's like 10 or 12 uh, formats which you can clone and easily simulate the thing. Um, half of you have done this stuff, okay. And what you need to do is to, to use the T55s 77 card and to write uh, the block data on it and you usually has to have this scrambling in this different format of it so we were like ah, yeah well we know a kind of plenty of formats we think we have support for 70 formats up there and it's hooked up to an interface of course so we can like make you know what we had 
this is knowledge that you know that Kevin and I have been having for for ages, but we haven't implemented into the proximal clients. We was like, yeah, why should we? It's like, yeah, yeah. it doesn't make any sense anymore. It's like, yeah. So we you know, let's do some interface instead for it and make sure that you know, they can call a service and you know that's it. This is based on a web service, so you can actually make an Android app calling this stuff, an iPhone app, whatever you want to do, and use the NFC to program it. You don't need a client for the, uh, the proximal client for it. Kind of cool. Or at least we think so. So data stored on access control cards is typically, uh, for access control applications, is typically referred to PACs, physical access control systems. That Those data blocks are usually stored within specific locations on uh, LF or HF cards. Uh, this uh, particular utility that you see here uh, allows us to be able to interpret that data backwards and forwards. So we could just do a raw read of any particular card technology type, get that information, punch it into here, determine what exactly uh, that card consists of in terms of you know what that data actually represents uh, to uh, perhaps a security integrator uh, where they generally speak in terms of site codes, card numbers. Uh, we've uh, provided uh, this particular interface just to make to abstract uh, all of that out. So all we need to do now is really sort of worry about what, what, what is that format that we're using, what, what are the site codes or card numbers or other attributes of the card that we might want to access. Uh, but after we've entered in that information, we can then turn that back into packs data, which can then be stored on the card. Okay. We've got we one more video. Out. No. We've got one more video. We've got one more video. You want to see one more video? Yes. It's like, well, yay! <laughs> I don't know about it. Yeah, you sort it out. Actually, we've got two videos, but you know, yeah, we are going to show one. Uh, it's about the standalone modes. Um, and standalone modes is something pen testers and red teams wants to, you know, they talk about, you know, and, and we talk about making the proxy more covert and small. You need a battery for it uh, in that sense. However, some people has been doing it. That was Colin, and uh, there's also a boggy tone who made. Oh, are you running it? Yes. Oh my. Well, uh, you know the Vidic system in in France. Maybe you don't. Have, maybe you have it here in, in. Yeah, you have it here. Oh, that's a shame. Anyway, um, it, the key system there is like uh, kind of predictable for several buttons, and and this guy Colin he made a standalone mode. Which predicts that and do, do this all the default keys checking and things and added support for, uh, uh, saving it to flash memory. So it actually dumps and his newest version actually dumps four of those, uh, tags. It goes kind of fast finding it, identifying it, dumping the whole card onto the flash memory and starts the emulator with. So the, the, so the Proxmark in standalone mode starts simulating that card immediately. And you can also click on button and you can clone it to an, a magic a magic card. Um, so that's one nasty standalone mode for Vidic. Uh, it looks just fancy on, on apples because uh, ASCII art doesn't look quite like this anymore, but still works, uses the flash memory. The next standalone mode, which you don't have a video on, is from Bogiton. It uses the 14 sniff. And it sniffs the traffic for you know, ultralights and tags and uh, uh, those kinds. You get the PVD and it saves it. It saves up to 64 PVDs uh, passwords out to the flash memory. So you go and sniff your traffic from a bus card or whatever you do, usually it is. And uh, you get the keys out and you can dump the card and you just can start analyzing from that. Very covert, you know. It's, it's all about this covert things is about getting the keys in order, in order to dump the cards and to start analyzing what's on the cards, you know. Yes, taken away. That's basically what it is over and over again. This one is kind of funny though. It takes about one and a half seconds to dump a card, find all the keys and dump it. And there's another thing about the Jigbo is it uses two sectors. You can't do very much with a dump of this card system. You can emulate it, but it has a counters and a lot of counter measurements against cloning. Uh, those two sectors that has data on it has two encrypted I know he's smiling. <laughs> uh, encrypted uh, data on it and, and yeah, uh, allow entry to the, to the house and um, for the postmen and police officers. Yeah. Apparently the, the, the ASCE key for it is not the best one I heard or something like that. It's the implementation of it doesn't use the right Q value or something like that. I don't know. What, do I, what would I know about that? Anyway. 
Yeah, okay. Nee, should we well? Yeah, okay. Yes, for the fun of it. It's, it's been a talk so much about wing locks. People talk about wing lock. And uh, you know the hotel hack? Uh, two Finnish researchers have secured 140 million hotel rooms possible to be hacked and using a standalone mode for uh, proximal free. <laughs> and it comes down how to emulate and simulate it. And this, oops, you can't, it's just running all the time. <laughs> God damn. When, when you try to, you know, if you, if, if, the wing lock is just normal um, ultra right tag usually. And uh, you can run the MFU info to get it out, uh, most of the data. Here's an important part. It's called the one-time pad, and it has a default password. So when you just, you know, punch that into the Proxmark, you will get an easy dump out of it. The whole system. You can easily identify that this is uh, Winglock because it uses this uh, SOAR key. And this one uses E3, so um, you can SOAR it, and you can see which room number and date stuff like that. What's in there? The protection of this card is in this block here called the OTP, the one-time pad, which is an uh, algorithm that calculates. We have, of course, implemented in my version, uh, not available for you guys, uh, but you have a PVD generation based on the UID, and you can actually just get it out. So cloning a wing lock is not very hard. And making that standalone mode that people talk about, yeah, it's it's been done. Put it like that. Long time ago. Anyway, yeah, uh, we have different for Windows use source of AI for classing and use different keys for that as well. It's all. It, take, it, it took me about three weeks to figure those keys out, so you can do it yourself as well. It's, it's not that hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, this one here is fun though. Is someone here into 3D printing? Oh, well, that's one way to help. You use that XYZ uh, filaments? You do? Ah, you know, it's, it's protected by this little. NFC chip, you know that. Yeah, I don't think you're Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, the algo is that, like that, so you can make your own. Yeah, we have a script for it as well, so you can just create your own. And you just put it on and you can buy this, whichever pi rated uh, filament and you just put it on the spool. Yeah, kind of fun. It's what you, you know, stuff you do for fun. The hack, the guy actually hacked that algo was kind of fun because he actually went into the microcontroller and did it. Swedish guy, but. I shouldn't say these things. Probably not. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'd have to go into hiding after this. Yeah, we'll better do but it. Just as well we didn't release anything else. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> we didn't say this too long, didn't we? Okay. So, now, now, oops. Q&A. Questions? Any questions? Hi, thanks for uh, the presentation. Uh, got a question about VGIC. Do you know, or uh, what do you think about this uh, security? Do you think it would be broken soon, or it's okay for many years? <laughs> That's a... <laughs> it's two people laughing in this room right now. <laughs> quiet, Chris, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Uh, yes, VGIC is very safe. Uh, those sectors, yes. Uh, dumping the card. Is not safe. Uh, the actually credentials, yeah. Well, I would say it can be done, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? So if I want to start into RFID security, because I have all the hardware at the lab, but uh, rarely use it, what would you suggest where to start? That's an excellent question. I think Did we have it? a slide for that. Uh, we most certainly do. Yeah, we do. I think Perfect. we have a slide for that. <laughs> yeah. 
Get, getting started with the Proxmark overall generally is quite overwhelming, especially for those that don't have a background uh, in RF, uh, because it, it's uh, RF in general is usually considered a black heart. There's a lot of things that a lot of people don't know or understand or, or want to understand for that matter. Uh, so uh, again, uh, with with this particular re revision, we took that in mind, and that's the that's the main reason why we decided to go for this optional antenna accessory where you can unbolt and bolt. Uh, various different antenna options on there. Uh, the probably the first place that you'd want to go to uh, is listed up here, uh, the uh, proxmark.org uh, forum. Uh, that's been there from day one. Uh, it's an absolutely fantastic resource. Uh, we encourage you all to jump on there, sign up. Uh, we have a bit of a, a bot uh, elimination process through which you'll essentially go into jail to begin with, prove that you're a meat bag, and then after you've done that, we'll then uh, give you the status of a contributor where you can then ask your questions and we will answer them. But we don't have any spam anymore. No more spam. No more spam. Uh, in addition to that, we have also uh, would like to encourage you to go to the GitHub repo and have a look at that. Uh, there's quite a few uh, uh, GitHub repos. Uh, obviously, the one that we want to draw... Uh, attention to is the RFID research uh, uh, group uh, Proxmark 3 uh, repo. There's also the, the main uh, GitHub repo, which is quite simply just the Proxmark repo, and of course the very popular Iceman uh, GitHub repo too. Uh, in addition to that, we've got the wiki uh, that uh, has a lot of uh, fundamentals, uh, a lot of getting started guides. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, some of the terminology, uh, we suggest that you start there. Uh, additional resources, files, etc. Uh, are also available from poxmark.org. Uh, we have uh, a, a simple utility uh, called Card Info. Uh, that's for anybody dealing with uh, access control cards, uh, physical access control cards. So if you'd like to interpret uh, PAX data into uh, ones and zeros and vice versa, that's sort of what it's for. Uh, and then we also have a, a wiki that's just sort of uh, just being fleshed out at the moment, uh, which would like to cover all aspects of RFID, NFC, contact-based card interfaces. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. We've got a lot of resources. Uh, we'd like to share those with you. Yeah. Among one thing is that, you know, people easily go like, okay, so it's a, it's a different device. Like, no, it's a plain Proxmark. You can use the old official Proxmark free repo, but you will have very limited support for the new features. All the other stuff works. It's just the same thing. Don't worry about it. And you flash it just the same way as you do everywhere else. It's, yeah, just do that. The RFID research group Proxmark repo contains all the fixes adapted for this device, the RV4 features. So you get, you know, when you, you want to have new features added on and things going for it, look there. If you want to use the, the SIM card and the flash memory stuff like that, that's what we do. That's the difference. That's the only is. Otherwise, the, the source code, I don't know, have, have you ever looked at the source code for Proxmark? It's a mess. So we didn't want to mess it up even more. That's why we made our own repo for it. Okay. And more? Come on, give us one, one more. Would you say that the state of the art of vendors is converging and they are sort of sharing the best practices or is there more a lot of uh, discrepancies in the security considerations between RFID vendors? Uh, that's that's a very good question. Uh, uh, we've got a lot of conflicts uh, with with various different peoples from various different industries. Uh, some people have very strong opinions on uh, how things should be conducted. Uh, some have the black hat. Some have the white hat. Uh, we we like to go as ethical as possible without uh, offending anybody. Uh, we have uh, in multiple instances been uh, given. Uh, uh, warnings by companies, but it's not as if we don't speak to them first to give them opportune time to address uh, some of their vulnerabilities. Uh, a lot of people, uh, especially uh, in uh, the access control sector, which is my area of interest, uh, tend to be very, very lazy and go through obscurity uh, rather than actual open source and uh, uh, disclose their, their crypto functionality. When it comes to that, often people will decide, I've figured out what they've done wrong, I'll just publish the information for, for the masses, and, and that's where the conflicts usually come from. Yeah. When you look at the complexity of a system, like this lock system, it's fairly complex. It's not a bad system per se. 
It takes dedicated hardware, dedicated people, you know, the, to get the state where you are today on the Proxmark. Ten years of development of individual, highly intelligent people has put in an effort into it. Academic research groups has been doing work in order for you to sit and run some simple commands. It's not simple. And the systems we make is usually really complex and quite good, given if I would start from zero. I'm kind of good at this. But if I would start to zero from today, I wouldn't be able to crack uh, my first classic old crypto by hand. You know, sorry, I, that's not going to happen. So in order to have all this, you know, you'll be standing on the shoulders of giants here in being able to do these things, which is fantastic. It enables both, you know, if uh, RFID uh, developers... Uh, Manufacturers would look at it like that. It's like, okay, fine, great. This is where we are today, but it's kind of safe as it is. Usually people go like, say, oh, it's bad and bad. Oh, they don't understand it. And oh, LF is bad. I'm like, yeah, well, nah. no, it's kind of complex. <laughs> it, it, and it's kind of good, but the other side is even better. All right. One more question. Come on. There we go. If today you have to recommend one technology, RFID technology for physical access control, what would you recommend as the most secure one? Uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, I personally, uh, I'm a fan of, excuse me, <coughs> uh, I'm a fan of EV, uh, Desfire EV2, or Desfire EV1. Uh, massive improvements to encryption between EV1 and EV2. Uh, also RF performance. Uh, there are a few fa failure uh, issues with uh, EV1. Uh, it's also got built-in uh, uh, anti-tamper uh, uh, measures uh, implemented within the technology itself. Uh, so, so there's a lot of ad advantageous uh, uh, aspects to that particular car technology type. Uh, it really does depend on where you're going though, like whether or not it's into payment systems or physical access or uh, some other area that uh, might not might not necessarily require that level of security uh, because obviously uh, with newer technology types or, or with the higher security, generally you end up paying a lot more for the credentials. So it's a bit of a trade-off between affordability versus effective uh, uh, ca uh, security countermeasures. Yeah, uh, I, I would say I would go for Deathfire EV2, I would say, if I would uh, that would be a very safe card system. They learned the lesson very well. Maybe a last question. Um, when you see uh, my for classic cards, for example, like the hotel using uh, default uh, keys, or if they are not using default keys, then just vulnerable to dark nested or stuff like that, do you even care about disclosing the stuff? And if you do, um, do the people in front of you take it seriously, or they just know it's vulnerable and don't care about it? We've been quite open uh, with a lot of the research that we've done. Uh, early days, uh, I used to get in a lot of trouble. I used to offend a lot of people. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I try to uh, be as political as possible when, when approaching, especially hotels, because hotel doors are essentially wide open. There's, it's, it's a novelty more than anything else. To, to get into most buildings, it's, it's really just a, a novelty. It's no different to a physical key. Uh, physical keys are oft, often most easily uh, copied because they're single wafer, quite, quite simple uh, keys. So with hotels, they're all my fair classic, as you said. Uh, a lot of people uh, using the uh, the newer generation of the my fair cards, which actually have a true random number generator built into them. So there is a little bit more security there. But one of the fundamental flaws uh, is not with the card, but with the implementation. So what they'll do is they'll have a, a large portion of the card is unconfigured, and then they'll secure one block uh, within, within the card. And what they really should be doing is uh, using uh, random keys throughout the entire of the card. That makes some of these attacks uh, very, very difficult, if not impossible in some scenarios. So that, that's something that, uh, as as a developer, as and as a uh, uh, as a security advisor, would probably suggest uh, that hotels either look at doing that, or perhaps moving across to another uh, different technology type. We will round up this Q&A by, uh, and we speak by saying some thank yous. Uh, uh, we have special thanks to say to Willock Sentinel Colin because of them we wouldn't have a, 
some of the software for the uh, RV4, and we're very grateful for it. And we're also extremely grateful for the Proxmo community. We love and share your little research hobby, and we really hope that you feel the same about it as well. So from us, we're here. Thank you. Because of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the great presentation.